Ross is the Chief Executive Officer of Protocol Insight, um, a leader in MIPI validation and test tools. Protocol Insight contributes to the development of Unipro through the Unipro Working Group and to the development of MIPI Product Registry through the Testing Work Group. Ross also serves as the liaison to the, um, to the other, uh, our partner organizations, JEDEC and UFSA. He's been in the test and instrument industry for over 25 years in general management, marketing strategy, and international business development. And he first managed protocol test tool development when he introduced a Bluetooth protocol analyzer in 2000 and also oversaw the, the in, introduction of the industry's first PCI Express protocol tool and the industry's first MIPI DeFi and MFI tools. So, uh, Ross. So before we get started, I'm, I'm interested in if you could give me a show of hands. How many of you people are working on a DeFi or uh, other uh, technology that's DeFi based? Okay, good, thank you. And CFI? CFI? Good. And then MFI? MFI, one there. Okay, good, thank you. That gives me an idea of who we've got in the audience here. So, uh, as we know, uh, MIPI has become the predominant technology for high bandwidth, low power um, interface uh, applications. And if you look at the different technologies that they have, you know, DeFi and CFi for the camera and display applications have been doing very well for, for a number of years. But then more recently, there's been the emergence of MFi, which uses the Unipro link layer in support of UFS. And these technologies, as they've become incorporated into end devices, uh, are now uh, critical to the design process. And so if you look at the design flow, the traditional design flow methodology, starting from your business and product requirements and then moving up to your actual design and then prototyping, how, how effectively you can incorporate your MIPI technologies into these designs uh, really has an influence on how quickly you can get your product to market. If you look at this typical design cycle here, once you get to the prototyping stage, you move through you know, a series of activities, power on, smoke test, establishing a link, and then moving to margin testing, corner case testing, and that type of thing, before you get to conformance testing to get the product to market. And the thing about it is that once you get to your first prototype, you, you need to move quickly through this process because the amount of time it takes to get from prototype to launch is critical. And the more times you have to spin a prototype or the more work you have to take, do, spend to debug that prototype, the longer it will take to get you to market. So what you ultimately need to do is you want to minimize this iterative loop between getting a prototype, testing it, verifying that it works, possibly having to create a second prototype and then test it because each prototype spin, as you guys know, can take two to three months. So what you want to do is find a way to more effectively move from the prototype phase into product launch and reduce the number of prototypes and the number of spins that you have. So if you look at that prototype verification cycle, there's a number of of steps to that that we're all very familiar with, right? If you look at what it takes to get your prototype up and running, you always start with your, your power on, your bring up, your smoke test. And then typically you have to implement some kind of a link, a link training sequence. This is similar uh, in, in uh, MVI as it is in PCI Express, where you have to do some kind of a link training to establish the link. And then once you get the link working, you have your components talking to each other over your, your MIPI interface, then you can move to this margin and corner case testing phase. That's the period of time where you're trying to verify the robustness of your design. So you're going to uh, generate test cases where you can exercise your device with corner parameters, timing, uh, extended timing margin, extended jitter margin, uh, uh, maybe different eye openings if you're looking at um, transmitter testing. And once you've done an extensive amount of this corner case and margin testing, you know that the, the design's robust, then you want to run those over an extended period of time. This is more like a silicon validation model where you're gonna run extended testing over time to see how the product uh, responds, you know, not only to a lot of different variables, but over an extended number of variables. 
If you can get through your automated or stress testing effectively, then kind of the last thing that you need to do is do some conformance testing. And I'll talk at the end of this presentation about some things that the MIPI Alliance is doing, offering product registry tools for you to do conformance testing of your products. And then ultimately interoperability testing. So what I'm going to cover today are, are these sections in the box. So for the types of work that we're talking about doing, from link startup through the corner case of stress testing and automated testing, you're going to have some traditional configurations for TX and for RX and for protocol. A typical TX setup will consist of a probing solution attached to a high bandwidth oscilloscope, if, especially if you're working with um, some of the newer versions of DSI, uh, uh, DFI and CFI and MFI. Uh, and for, for RX testing, some form of a packet generator, data generator, a BERT um, or an AWG that you can use to stimulate your device under test and then capture the results in the oscilloscope. And then for protocol testing, you're going to need some form of a protocol analysis tool uh, that you can use to drive your DUT and then capture the results uh, in some kind of a test executive software. Especially when you're working at the higher, the application level, like UFS, for example, then um, there's a lot of work that you want to do to actually exercise the protocol as well. So that's kind of the typical setup that you're going to work with. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some common observations that we've had and then some methodologies that you can implement to try and reduce that cycle to move from link startup through the stress testing to the, the conformance testing more quickly. The observations uh, that we have at Protocol Insight is mostly focused on Unipro and UFS. That's kind of our, our area. So my first set of examples will be Unipro based. Protocol Insight has, has worked pretty closely with the UFSA to support their IoT workshops. And we have also supported all of the MIPI uh, Unipro workshops. And when Project R was running at Google, we were pretty actively involved with, with that project. And so based on that, we've observed a number of fairly common things when you're trying to bring the link up. So in this link uh, startup phase of debug. The common issues that we've typically seen are around things like actually doing the link startup sequence or the capabilities exchange the power mode changes that you want to go through to establish the base link. And then once that's been done, then actually booting UFS as an application or in the case of the, the Project Aura phone, booting that module. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you three examples. One example for link startup, one example for capabilities, and one for power mode of the types of challenges that you would find. Now, these are specific to Unipro, but if you're working with other serial interfaces like M5 that have a link training sequence, you will run across these types of things as well. So I mentioned that the common challenges that we've seen are around link startup, capabilities exchange, and power mode. So in link startup, the two most common problems are things to do with out-of-order packet sequence and packet timing issues. So if you think about the Unipro link startup sequence, it's actually a very complex process. The Unipro link startup sequence is a seven-phase process that starts with sending information from one device to the other device about the physical lane connectivity of the link. So Unipro is a four-lane interface but you don't always have all lanes turned on. So in the first phase, phase zero, phase zero B, you're actually sending information back and forth between the devices about which lanes exist and are powered on. The next phase then is to logically map those active lanes within the system. And then from there, then you actually have to exchange capabilities information back and forth between the devices to say, I can support these power modes, I can support these speeds and these link widths. And it's not until you get all the way through that that you've actually got a link established. So that's actually what this ladder diagram represents here is the series of exchanges between one side of the link and another side of the link as you exchange uh, physical mapping information and then logical mapping information and then capabilities information and then you finally exit the process with a valid established link. So, one of the biggest challenges with Unipro is getting the link established, successfully executing 
link startup. So really what you need to be able to do is actually track your device as it moves through the link startup process. That, as you can imagine, can be very complex. So ideally, the way you want to do this is you want to be able to take a look at that link, monitor the link startup as it's executing. And you want to be able to find the first packet in that link that initiates the link startup and then track to make sure that every subsequent packet that's transmitted follows the ladder diagram in the specification. The easiest way to do that is to build a state machine. So if you build a state machine model, you can actually look at every packet in the trace, look for states, and then look for subsequent events. And then once you see those, then you can actually log messages to tell the engineer where the problems lie in the link startup sequence. And this is a graphical representation of how we do it at Protocol Insight. We actually allow you to build a, a, a state machine model of the link startup sequence. We provide it, or you can build your own, that allows you to then go through the trace and look for the type of events that are occurring. So by using a state machine approach, that actually allows you to track the packets that are being transmitted through the link to establish the link and actually generate messages. So you can see here that you can find where you move through the different phases. You find the first trig UPR0, and that tells you to move to phase 0B. You find another packet, you move to phase 1, and then phase 2, phase 3, and phase 4 and 5 until you see that the link is successful. If you can track the traffic on your link in that fashion and generate these messages, as an engineer, you can immediately find out how the link startup sequence progressed and if it was effective without having to drill down into the packets yourself. But as you know, things don't always go the way you'd like. So if you analyze a link startup and you find problems, then you need to understand what those problems are. This is one of the most common failures that we see when we work with customers that are trying to get their Unipro link to work correctly. And that's a timing violation. If you look at the Unipro specification on table 13, it defines the, the packet sequence that has to be executed. But in several other places in the specification, it also defines the timing required. And in the case of Unipro, it says that you open a burst, you send packets, you close the burst. Then you have to wait. Um, T-activate uh, T time requires that you wait 1.6 milliseconds before you reopen the burst. And then you can send more packets and then close the burst. So if you open a burst and send a packet and then close the burst, and then you initiate that again too soon, then devices may not be able to accommodate that. They're not tolerant. So in this case, what you do is you actually run a state machine model against it, and it will look at every single packet, like I showed you before. But in this case, there's a red X there. And if you read that, which I'm actually not sure if you can, <laughs> what it says is, there's a timing violation where the start of burst occurred less than 1.6 milliseconds after the end of burst. And if you go look at the protocol analyzer listing display, what you can see here is that the, this end, uh, start of burst occurred 1.5 milliseconds before or after the preceding end of burst. So timing violation, you tried to reopen the burst too soon after you terminated the previous burst. So these are the kind of things that you want to find quickly if you are having link startup failure issues. You can resolve these in firmware, try another image, see if it works, and that will help you to get more quickly through the prototype power on phase, right? Another common issue that you'll find are capabilities exchange uh, failures. So that once you get through the, uh, the logical and the physical lane mapping, part of the link startup sequence. The next thing that you want to do is exchange capabilities. Each device needs to advertise, I can support a certain speed, I can support a certain bandwidth, I can support scrambling, I can support auto non-auto mode. So that's the capabilities exchange. And if you look at the capabilities exchange, again, the standard is very clear. It specifies that um, uh, after finishing phase four, you'll start a burst and transmit capabilities and then close the burst, right? So what that means is in between the start and the end of the burst, the only thing that you can see, should see on the link, are capabilities packets. So again, if you run a state, a state machine against a trace, it might move you nicely through phases zero through zero B all the way to phase five, 
But in this case, very commonly, we'll see a violation. If you look at the, the listing, what you can see here is we've got a capabilities indicator, and then we've got a capabilities, but then before we close the burst, there's other packets in here, two ASCs and another startup burst. So that's a violation, again, of the standard. In, again, one device might tolerate this, but if a device was designed where it strictly follows the standard, it might not accept this, and so then you will never get an effective link startup uh, completed. So I'll show you one more example through the link startup phase, and then we'll talk about margin and corner case testing. The last example is a very common issue we see in power mode change. Uh, in power mode change, um, what you're basically doing is once you execute through link startup, you exit link startup and you downgrade to PWM gear one, so low power mode. And then from there, then you initiate a power mode change to move to whichever speed and link width the device desires once the link is established. So after you complete link startup, the next thing you do is you initiate power mode change. And power mode change has its own ladder diagram that describes exactly what steps um, to go through between the local and the peer device on the link. And the important thing to notice is this is PACP power request. This is the power change initiation. And this is PACP power conf. This is the confirmation. Between that time, there should be no other traffic on the link. So once one side of the device has initiated a PACP power request, a power change uh, initiation, there should be no additional traffic on the link until the, the uh, the other end of the link um, has changed state and you've got a conf back. And believe it or not, even though you can see here, here's an example of one that works successfully. We initiate a PACP power request. We see a success flag and then we will go back and check. You can, you can send a power mode request and the device might come back with a conf, but do you really know that the, the, the other end of the link actually changed to the power mode state that was requested. So you want to check that. So then you'll send a query back and determine what state the link is in and compare that to what was in the initial power mode request to make sure that it's valid. So this is an example of a PACP power request and a comp, so it was successful, but then we query and we determine that the TX and the RX are both in the state that was requested in the initial request. So this is a success. But again, like everything else, power mode changes don't always go well. Uh, there's a number of different things that we commonly see, um, including things like out-of-order packet sequence, uh, devices that actually can't effectively change into certain modes, like auto, non-auto, um, fast, slow. And then this last one's interesting. We see a lot of customer devices where it will successfully execute a power mode change once or twice, but if you do the stress testing, which I'll talk about later, and you run through 50 power mode changes or 100 power mode changes, the device will go off into the weeds and it will get hung up. It is not robust and it does not handle multiple power mode changes effectively. So you want to look for things like that. What I'm gonna talk about here though is this example of packet order sequence. Okay, so in a power mode change, the specification says that between power request and power comp, you're not allowed to see any other traffic on the link. I showed you that in the ladder diagram a few minutes ago. But in this example here, again, where we run a state machine, our trace validation tool against a link, what you can see here is that there is a violation. If you come down to the, um, the listing window, you can see that the, <laughs> the power request here, but then you can see here's a start of burst, another power request, an end of burst, another power request, and then a comp. So because you have all this additional traffic between here, this is actually a failure, right? So you did not successfully e execute the power change request. But the interesting thing is that the standard actually allows you to initiate multiple power requests. You can't see anything else on the bus, but you can initiate multiple power requests. So in this example here, what we're showing is we have multiple power requests. These are flagging warnings, not errors, but warnings. Uh, but still, you see an error and a failure because you also have this end of burst right here and that start of burst there. Ultimately, this device did successfully execute a power mode change because it initiated a request here and a comp there. So that's an example of, of the kind of issues that you're going to run into as you're trying to establish a link with Unipro. 
right? And again, this is very similar to, to other technologies. Uh, getting the link established is a critical part of the first phase of the prototype debug. Once you've got your link up and running, then the next thing that you want to do is you want to do margin and corner case testing. The idea here is you now can get the, the two devices to talk to each other on the link. Now you want to make sure that they're going to be up for a long time. So you can do margin testing or corner case testing, right, where you can actually test where you can send traffic down the link that is, that is errored, right? You can inject errors into the link, see how your device responds. You, you might want to corrupt the packet data. You might want to corrupt the packet headers in the case of um, protocol or in the case of TX and RX physical characteristics, right? So you can see here things like um, eye width, eye height, unit interval, jitter, rise time. Tweak those, right? You're going to attenuate your rise time. See how that the, uh, the uh, receiver responds to that. Um, in the case of protocol, I already mentioned, you know, corrupting packets, uh, headers, and payloads, and that kind of thing. And ultimately, what you want to do is you want to be able to push your device to the edge and see how it responds. As a test strategy, you might even define a certain amount of margin that you want to design into your product. And so then you can build corner case tests around that that will push to that, that, um, to that margin envelope that you've defined. So for protocol, a classic example would be injecting uh, different kind of parameters into the packet. For example, um, in Unipro, you might want to do things like um, uh, invert bits or uh, corrupt your uh, CRCs, right? Or um, in a PACP parameter, you might uh, want to inject errors into the symbol frames, right? And then you send those corrupt packets and see if the device responds correctly at the protocol level as well. Okay. So once you have uh, got your link up and running and you've done margin corner case testing, then the next step that you want to take is you're going to want to do some automated testing. Uh, so you've got a basic design you know is robust, but now you want to make sure that it will run over time. One of the things that I mentioned earlier is one of the things that we found in Unipro is power mode change is very susceptible to repetition. So you get a design and it will effectively execute power mode change for the first couple of times, but then over time it, it will drift and it will stop working. So you can put automated testing in place to try and verify the, um, the product with extensive testing. So, and in this case, you might want to do the automated testing where you're testing these previously designed margin or corner case tests that you've created, or you could also do your automated testing where you're executing conformance or compliance tests. If you have a tool that has conformance or compliance capability, then you can actually run those over an extended period of time. One of the key things that you want to do is you want to be able to run large loops extended numbers of loops, but you also want to be able to vary the order, the sequence, because you want to look for data dependencies in the results of your automated testing. So if you can vary, for example, if you're running a, um, a um, uh, transmitter test, right, where you want to vary the jitter that you introduce or the, the eye height or the eye width, and then the next time you run the test, you might want to vary the eye and then the jitter, something like that, so that you can see if you get a different result. But then once you've ran those tests, you get the results if you have failures, you actually need to be able to trace those back through. So you want the capability to vary your automated tests, but then trace that back through so that once you found a failure, you can determine what it was that preceded it in case that has an effect on the result. So this is a DeFi example here of um, a TX testing system where the first thing you do is you start out by configuring your device. Uh, you know, large amplitude terminated. Um, I'm going to run in high speed gear three. So configure your device. Then you can select a whole series of tests. And again, these might be custom tests you've created. They might be tests that were provided by the test instrument manufacturer that, does, uh, that has developed conformance tests. And then run those tests and then generate some sort of an output report. Now, most of these tools are going to give you a generic PDF report so that you can submit those to uh, say, in the case of MIPI, you can submit those to the product registry. In the case of UFSA, you can submit them for UFSA approval. Um, 
but then also a lot of these tools will output uh, you know, exportable data so that you can then do statistical analysis on your results too. This is an example of an RX testing automated solution here where you can select a different you know, range of tests, frequency offset tolerance, uh, uh, termination enabled time tests, and run those tests. And again, uh, this isn't my tool, but it gives you a cute little smiley face if you passed. Um, so I guess it en enlivens the atmosphere in the lab. In the case of protocol, similarly, you might want to be able to set things like the order. In this case, this is uh, our, our tool, uh, Unipro tool, so you can, you can change the order of traffic class, um, speed, PWM, uh, gear one, HS gear three, link width by one, by two, by three, by four, uh, and then the tests as well. Do you want your tests to operate in down, up, or you can, in, in our case, you can set it according to random seed, in which case it's a defined, known, randomized order to execute your tests. So once you've ran your automated tests, you now have an idea of how robust your design is, not only in terms of just margin corner case capability, but also over time, you're feeling pretty good about it. That's when you're ready to take it to market. So now you want to do your conformance testing just to verify, and then do your compliance testing. If you look at MIPI, all of the major um, uh, FIs and the, the client applications that run on top of them um, have some variant of a CTS specification. Some of them are draft, some of them are final. Um, that you can actually use to take a look at your conformance testing. I'll talk in a minute about the product registry. You can also do other types of conformance testing where there's not a CTS available. Um, but specifically, you know, if you look at uh, what MIPI Alliance has, they, they, they generate CTSs like this is for the battery interface. Uh, CTS version 1.0 is available to support BIF. Unipro has version 1.1 out, which supports Unipro 1.1, 1.6, and 1.61. If you're working with UFS, um, there's a uh, JETIC CTS for UFS 2.0, 2.1, and the external card spec. It's called JESD 224. This is actually under review and revision by JETIC right now. But these CTS tools will give you the ability to determine what kinds of tests you should be executing to get the right level of coverage. You may execute these as conformance test tools, um, or you may just use them as reference documents for defining the, the set of internal tests that you're going to use. So one final note in terms of how to get through this process as quickly as possible is, as you guys are designing your DUTs, keep signal access in mind. When you guys build a DUT, a prototype, that you're going to want to run through this verification process that I've just talked about um, from link startup through the corner case and margin testing to the stress testing and conformance, you need to have signal access. So ideally, if you can put down uh, SMA connectors on your device, that's optimal because that allows you then to hook up some kind of a data generator or pattern generator or exerciser to drive your device. Um, some people don't have the room, and so they will put down ZIF tips. ZIF is still better than nothing because that way then if you have problems, at least you still can get signal observability into your device so that you can capture traces. You can't necessarily control them, but you can capture them to look at them. You might also look at things like um, uh, resistor termination boards. Another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of uh, conformance test specs or compliance test specs, CTSs, Define tests that require some sort of a reset or a hard reboot. So uh, we always advise our customers, when you're building a DUT um, or an early prototype, provide access to some sort of a reset signal. Ideally, it's a reset signal uh, trace that you can bring out to an SMA or something else. Or if you have to, you can solder a green wire down to it. But that way, then, if you want to do the automated testing, which is highly recommended, you can access that reset signal so that you can run automated tests and do re resets in between if, if appropriate. So now what I'm going to do is transition a little bit. I've talked to you about the importance of moving through that prototype cycle as quickly as possible. And I've talked to you about some of the common things that we've observed uh, with my company working with Link Startup, which I think you can translate to any 
um, serial interface. And then we've talked about corner case and margin and stress testing and conformance testing. If you effectively execute those, you'll be able to move through the, the, the prototype phase more quickly, and you can minimize the number of prototypes you have to build, so you can reduce that spin. Once you've gotten to the point where you've got a product that you think is robust, you've done your own internal conformance testing, right? then you want to consider doing interoperability testing and maybe uh, trying to get certification. So the MIPI Alliance uh, offers some of these capabilities as benefits to their members. So uh, a number of the different working groups like, like Unipro um, offer workshop opportunities where you can go and take your device and plug in and work through with uh, other people that are working on the same technology. But in addition to that, the MIPI Alliance just last month launched the new registry process. The registry process is an, is an opportunity for you to um, step through a, a process of verifying the conformity of your product to the MIPI standards and then uh, being able to promote that. So if you want more information on that, uh, there's a number of important documents that you might want to reference. A MIPI test policy and registry program policy document is available. Um, they're all up on the product registry website at this uh, URL here. But in addition to that, for whichever standard you're working with, you should reference the CTS if it's available, reference the specification itself, right? and then also look to see if there's been a, a methods of implementation written by a test vendor for how to test that specific standard uh, for conformance. So one note on this, and I think that um, this has been touched on in some of the other talks yesterday and today, but uh, the note on the difference between conformance and compliance. You'll notice I've been very careful to reference conformance. Conformance is designing your product and then performing a set of your tests to verify that your design is conformant to the normative um, elements of the spec. And if you do some testing to verify conformance to a MIPI specification, then you have a high degree of confidence that you will interoperate with other devices and you can sell your component to somebody else that can integrate it with their component in a MIPI ecosystem and it will work. But it's not compliance. Compliance is more like what the UFSA is doing for UFS memory where you actually will test through a very structured and rigid program and you'll get a logo certification. So what MIPI is offering is a very nice conformance program that you can use to verify conformance to the normative spec and then register your product. So the registry program was developed by the test working group, working with uh, the technical leads and a number of the uh, other technical work groups. Um, and um, I'd like to put out a, just a, a vote or a, a a shout out here that if any of you guys are interested in influencing the direction of test in MIPI, you should consider getting involved in the test work group. But the MIPI product registry process basically relies on the conformance test suites largely. And these CTSs are unique to each spec. So you'll have a CTS um, for Unipro. You'll have a CTS for battery interface. You'll have a CTS for uh, MFI. And they're authored by the technical work groups, not the test work group, but the test work group will review those. And it defines the set of test procedures and methods that you should execute to ensure conformity to the specification. So the MIPI uh, product registry testing process um, also calls out methods of implementation. Methods of implementation are written by test vendors. Basically, these are documents that say, if you want to test to a specific uh, CTS, uh, like Unipro or Battery Interface, then with our testing instrumentation, here's how you would execute those tests. And the methods of implementation for the product registry process are developed by the test vendors and submitted to the test working group, and they review them. OK, so um, the actual testing process, what it says is that Contributor members may self-test using a CTS and an MOI, if it's available, um, or they may go to a MIPI-approved test lab. And then when you register your products, they'll be noted as to being either self-tested or uh, tested by a test lab. Adopter members must use a MIPI-approved test lab. 
And then the members, after doing the testing, will submit the results to the MIPI product registry website, and those will be reviewed and then placed up on the, on the registry. So the process says that uh, what you do is you use a currently approved CTS. In some cases, a CTS isn't available, so I would contact the product registry administrator and they can guide you in that, but there is a way that you could get registry without a CTS in some, ca in some cases. Uh, and then you must pass all the applicable tests in the CTS. Now, there are some features that are optional, not normative, uh, in every specification. And so in that case, you, wouldn't, you would not be required to execute those tests, obviously. But you would be required to execute all tests for uh, normative features, that, uh, for optional features that are incorporated into your design. Okay. And you can, whoops, get a, uh, you can get a listing by similarity. Once you've gotten one product registered, you can petition the product registry administrator and they uh, would consider a second listing of a similar product by similarity and there's uh, criteria that you'd step through for that. So kind of the, the final note is for any of these standards that MIPI offers, typically you're gonna find a set of test solutions available that will help you to move through that prototype debug and verification cycle. Typically, you're going to find transmitter uh, characterization tools, different types of scopes and probes, receiver characterization tools, typically BERTs or AWGs. Uh, there's also going to be signal integrity verification tools like uh, TD, oscilloscope PDR or network analysis. And then for protocol analysis, you're typically going to find some type of uh, protocol analysis instrument and some kind of a test executive software package that runs on top of it. So in summary, um, you know, this prototype debug and verification cycle, it can cost you time to market. The longer it takes you to get your prototype verified or the more times you have to spin it because you find issues, that can add two or three months for each spin. So you want to try and shorten that and the focus should be on this verification process and how to move effectively through it quickly. Find your issues fast, find your issues the first time. And once you've gotten to the point where you've got a product that you feel is robust, uh, MIPI encourages you to register your product with the product registry. It allows you to showcase to your potential customers, other MIPI members, uh, that you have a product that is conformant and it's robust. And it's important to, to know that for almost all of these standards that MIPI uh, has developed, there are pretty robust test tools available for you guys. So that summarizes my Talk, and at this point, I'd like to open it up if anybody has any uh, questions or comments that I can answer for you. Uh, nobody, we do have a couple minutes. How much time do we have? We have two minutes and 37 seconds, according <laughs> to Jim's timer. Well, thank you guys all for uh, attending. I hope you found it worthwhile. And if you guys have any further questions, you can catch me outside or you know who your contacts are at, at MIPI, Jim Rippey and the other guys, you can talk to them as well. Thanks again.